A gravity wave is uh, a wave of uh, changing metric of space-time. So it's, it's a ripple in space-time. Uh, it's difficult to visualize uh, a change in metric or a ripple in space-time, but maybe one way to represent it is if you have a, um, a perfectly square box of, of shape in space-time uh, in an XY kind of coordinate plane, that uh, the box would start out square and then it would stretch one way and it would stretch the other way. As it's getting narrower in one direction, it's getting longer in the other direction. And then and it oscillates back and forth. It never just changes in one dimension and not in the other. Because of conservation of momentum, uh, it's required that, it, that if uh, one axis is growing, the other axis is shrinking. Uh, so this is called a quadrupole solution. And it's the simplest solution uh, that, that has wave type properties. Uh, and it's a, sh a solution that is predicted by general relativity. Well, how much support does the current LIGO experiment, which measures low frequency gravity waves, offer for grav waves research? Uh, certainly if LIGO uh, measured a gravitational wave, that would be a very exciting breakthrough for everyone. Uh, the problem there with LIGO is that you're, you're not in control of the, of the gravitational wave generation side of things. You're, you're purely detecting gravitational waves. What uh, GravWave LLC wants to do is uh, do a laboratory generation of gravitational waves, which is much easier with high frequency gravitational waves than with low frequency. With low frequency gravitational waves, you'd need something on the size of a planetary system or a binary star system to generate a discernible gravitational wave. With a high frequency gravity wave, the coupling is much better. Uh, and in some cases, you can take advantage of, uh, of benefits of the higher frequencies to get slightly better coupling. And so you want to generate it in the lab at a high frequency. And this high frequency ripple then is measured or detected at the other end. Uh, and so that's, that's really the difference between what LEGO is doing and what GravWave wants to do. How does the mainstream scientific community perceive high frequency gravity wave research? Uh, the perception in the mainstream is that the experiments are going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to do. Uh, admittedly, they will be very difficult. But if we work through the numbers um, and we get a solution in terms of signal to noise ratio that, that closes, that that is uh, a believable detection level, then we see that you know it, it is difficult, but it's not impossible. And so it's right on the, the fringe of what's considered uh, possible to do right now. And that's why uh, you don't see a lot of emphasis in mainstream physics uh, right now. It's just because um, everyone knows how difficult this would be to do. Are high frequency gravitational waves supported by conventional physics? Uh, high frequency gravitational waves are supported by conventional physics. Um, conventional physics, um, dating back to Einstein, um, a century ago, uh, predicted gravitational waves from the general theory of relativity. So anyone that believes in the general theory of relativity, and there, there are some dissenting opinions, but, but most physicists, I think, will agree that it's been a very uh, valid uh, measure of the behavior of space-time. Uh, anyone that uh, believes in the general theory of relativity believes that gravitational waves could occur. It's just a matter of uh, can we produce them in the lab at a level that we can detect. Who performed the underlying supporting research for today's high frequency gravitational wave theories? Well, in terms of theory, uh, those that have supported high frequency gravitational waves the most, I would have to list um, Bob Baker. Um, I would have to list Clive Woods, who's worked on a lot of theoretical applications that might lead to focusing elements or antenna elements for high-frequency gravitational waves. Um, uh, names like uh, Rudenko and Grischek come to mind for the Russians. Uh, for the Chinese, uh, certainly Dr. Fan Yu Li, uh, Chongqing University, is the leading researcher in gravitational waves. Those would be uh, the leaders in terms of theoretical work. Yeah, how would uh, doctors Einstein and Forward fit into the theoretical model? Um, if you go back far enough, um, Einstein was the first one to predict gravitational waves. Uh, if you then play it forward from that, what is the history? Uh, Weber um, 
had originally um, tried to measure these with Weber bars. Uh, he was never successful in measuring gravitational waves, but he was, he was on the right track. Kind of, you want to uh, try to get a detection scheme that's sensitive enough to detect relic high-frequency gravity waves. If you can detect the relic high-frequency gravity waves, then you know your detector works. Then you move on to the generator. Um, another uh, name that comes to mind is Bob Forward. Bob Forward uh, continued the work of Weber and, and continued, uh, at least theoretically, uh, various uh, attempts to, to measure high gravitational, high frequency gravitational waves. Uh, now Dr. Baker is, is the next one in line to attempt it. And every time there are attempts made, the technology is a little further along. But what are relic high frequency gravitational waves? Uh, relic high frequency gravitational waves are gravitational waves that are, that are left over from the Big Bang. These are gravitational waves that have been oscillating since the Big Bang occurred. Uh, they slowly dampen out. But the nice thing about relic high frequency gravitational waves is the Big Bang was, is, uh, was predicted to be a broad spectrum source of gravitational waves. And there were uh, different epochs uh, of the Big Bang. Uh, they were a predominant uh, feature of the universe. There may still be some of these high frequency gravity waves out there that are left over from the Big Bang. Although they're weaker, uh, we could still possibly measure these oscillations. Is there currently any laboratory evidence for the existence of high frequency gravitational waves? Uh, there is no uh, lab laboratory um, measurements that have been made that, that show gravitational waves exist. We're, st we're still waiting for the first uh, clues the gravitational waves exist. So why is that? Uh, we're, uh, for LIGO, for low frequency high gravity waves, we're, we're waiting for a generation source that's big enough and strong enough and close enough to be able to measure them. For high frequency gravitational waves, the detectors are not yet sensitive enough to, to measure things that we can do in the lab. That's changing. Uh, Dr. Robert Baker and GravWave have worked in the past with the Chinese HFGW lab. I'm wondering um, what that partnership might mean in terms of detection. There is uh, a joint project right now between GravWave and uh, Chinese researchers su such as Dr. Fang Yu Li at Chongqing University. And uh, those, those partnerships are going to share in the intellectual property of both partners so that we can get a detectable high frequency gravity wave. That would benefit everyone. Uh, what kind of penetration do HFGWs have? Uh, the penetration of high frequency gravity waves is very good. Uh, HFGW will penetrate through anything. So obviously that, that leads to some interesting applications. For instance, uh, communication that doesn't have to be line of sight. It can go through the earth. Um, frequency time standards that don't have to be line of sight. Things of that nature would become possible through the use of gravitational waves. Given the remarkable penetration of high frequency gravitational waves, how can they be even detected? Uh, that is an interesting question, uh, the question of t detection of high frequency gravity waves. You have to find something that is sensitive to a change in metric. Um, so one of the ways that you can do that is with a circulating uh, microwave. If you have a circular waveguide and um, a gravitational wave goes through the waveguide, it will actually change the shape of the waveguide. As the waveguide is, is changing in shape, that will change the phase of the circulating energy. Uh, that's the Ingley and Cruz uh, solution, and um, that is one way that you could uh, measure a gravitational wave. Now, the, the detection sensitivity is not there yet on that particular type, but there are other types that measure metric changes. How fast do high-frequency gravitational waves propagate? Uh, in terms of propagation speed, um, there's, there's, there's two different camps. Uh, the standard solution says that the probably gravitational waves propagate at the same speed as the speed of light. So that would be C. Another camp, um, which is a non-standard uh, approach, uh, says that gravitational waves propagate instantaneously. Um, I guess that's one of the things we'll determine uh, in the set of experiments that we're, we're going to be doing. 
Uh, but right now, um, the solution that we're assuming is that gravitational waves propagate at the speed of light. The textbook orbital mechanics used to compute trajectories by NASA assumes an infinite speed of propagation for gravity. If this turns out to be the case for high frequency gravitational waves, then what benefits does that construe for communications? Obviously, if it turns out that gravitational waves do propagate faster than the speed of light, that would be extremely beneficial to um, outfits like NASA because then you could have uh, instantaneous communication between here and Mars, between here and Jupiter, between here and another solar system. Uh, for space travel, that would have significant consequences. Instead of waiting seconds, days, years before you get uh, a light type of signal, you could have communication that was instantaneous. In terms of predicted available bandwidth for communications, what is the range for high frequency gravitational waves in comparison to the electromagnetic bandwidth spectrum we're currently familiar with? If you look at the spectrum we're currently familiar with, the electromagnetic spectrum, that entire spectrum could be replicated in gravitational waves. So what you'd be doing um, with the gravitational wave spectrum is opening up the whole spectrum all over again uh, for use but now the spectrum is the gravitational wave spectrum versus electromagnetic. Would there be a financial benefit in licensing a high frequency gravitational wave spectrum? Uh, the benefit of, of generating uh, gravitational wave communications gear would be that you could license now a whole new spectrum and it would, it would essentially double the available spectrum. What is GravWave's first step towards commercializing high-frequency gravitational wave technology? I think GravWave's first step in commercializing uh, gravitational wave technology would be in the area of frequency time standards. Uh, it's much easier to do this on the ground than it is in mobile sets, so you probably want transmitters on the ground and receivers in, in mobile sets. And so if that's the case, um, most of the gear is not going to be geared around communications, but it could be geared around a frequency time standard where you're having one generator to many receivers. Have you developed a benchmark strategy for the development and commercialization process? Uh, the benchmark strategy that we have in place for commercialization is uh, the High Frequency Gravitational Wave Roadmap. Uh, and this roadmap shows um, uh, first the fundamental science occurring, uh, and then a stepwise process at research and development and, and then coming out of that development uh, some commercial applications, some viable commercial applications. Who holds the intellectual property for this technology? Uh, the intellectual property uh, by and large, most of the intellectual property in terms of generators, uh, especially now technology generators, is held by uh, GravWave LLC. Uh, there are other inventors. Uh, I mentioned the Ingley and Cruz detector. Uh, Clive Woods has a number of designs on uh, gravitational wave optics. Uh, but by and large, on the generation side, uh, quite a lot of that is Dr. Baker with GravWave. What will your first marketable product be? The first marketable product, uh, and I would have to guess right now, uh, will probably be a frequency time standard. That would be much easier to do because it can be low bandwidth and it can be very large transmitters. Uh, the next step after that, then we would probably look at more communication, uh, such as possibly a strategic communication role. <laughs> Welcome to downtown Seattle. Sirens every hour on the hour. Okay. Um, can you describe for me the business benefit of a high frequency gravitational wave time standard for the telecommunications industry? Uh, in terms of a frequency time standard for telecom, uh, this would be beneficial for spectrum use. So if you have a good solid uh, frequency time standard that all of the handsets are using, all of the cell towers are using, that everyone can agree on, uh, then that allows you to uh, drastically shrink uh, the uncertainty in frequency and in time so that you can more efficiently use your frequencies and you can more efficiently use your phase space. Uh, and so this would allow you multipliers of times four, even times eight in terms of bandwidth usage if you could uh, 
make sure that everybody is on the same, uh, for instance, code sync. Make sure that everybody is using uh, certain pieces of the phase space. Now uh, that's the kind of thing you can do with a uniform, universal frequency time standard. How will this time standard be provided? As a service, or a plug and play module, or a single broadcast with associated receivers? Uh, we see the frequency time standard being supplied as a service. And this service would go hand in hand with plug-in modules that would replace the uh, standard quartz crystal type uh, frequency standard that's found in uh, handsets and replace that with um, a gravitational wave receiver, a miniaturized gravitational wave receiver uh, that is geared towards uh, supplying the frequency standard that everybody else is receiving from the same uh, frequency time standard. So we see it as a, a service provider based model uh, with a with a standard uh, gravitational wave reference that everyone's using. How much investment do you expect will be required to reach market and what will the return on that investment be? Uh, it's difficult right now for me without doing uh, the phase A, phase B, phase C study work that we want to do and we want to be funded to do uh, to answer the question about you know, well what's the return on investment. We don't really know what the return on investment will be yet because we haven't uh, gone far enough down the path to do the, the kinds of modeling we need to do. There was a paper that uh, Colby Harper uh, and I put out earlier that took some estimates about return on investment. And obviously if you're able to double or even quadruple the useful bandwidth of telecom, that's going to have significant financial benefit. Will there be significant costs? Certainly these experiments will be uh, fairly expensive to run, uh, but um, as far as an exact return on investment, it's difficult at this point to predict.